Each week we put up a, a QR code, so if you'd like to follow the message points on your device, you can do so. In preaching through the Bible, I have had to address issues that are difficult. I've had to deal with topics that I might not have chosen to to, to, uh, to deal with if I myself were picking the topics or the themes of the sermons. Because some topics, they're just not fun. Some topics don't make you leave feeling good about yourself or just happy with everything around you. And so if, if you want to ignore those topics, you're free to do so. But if you're reading through the Scripture on your own, you come across those topics, you question, say, what is this talking about? Luke chapter 12, verses 41 to 48 is one of those sections. Turn with, your, turn with me to Luke 12, 41 to 48. Last week we covered the message of watchfulness, being prepared for the Lord's return. When the master returns, will you be prepared for his return? The week before, we looked again at, the, at, at God's watch care of his children and, and those who are going to be ready for him. So Jesus is teaching these things. And in verse 41, Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, who then? is a faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant to whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. This is the, the theme of the previous parable that Jesus taught. So he's answering Peter. Peter says, who are you talking, describing? And so the first person Jesus describes is the one who is faithful, and we talked about him last Sunday. Verse 45, but Jesus continues, but suppose, but suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming, and he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women and to eat and to drink and to get drunk, of course, using the master's food and wine, not his own. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he is not aware of, okay? So this guy is not waiting. He's not prepared. Look at, look with, at what he says he will do. The master will come. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers, did you read that right? It's kind of a harsh teaching, isn't it? He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant, however, this is the second guy, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. Okay, this guy wasn't quite as bad as the first guy. He's not cut in pieces, but he's beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. Okay, so we have three different categories of servants here. Do you see this? So our message here, we're going to see Jesus at his return. He, he foretells about four groups of people. The faithful, the seriously unfaithful, the secondary unfaithful, and the minimal unfaithful. Four different groups of people. But he is going to return, and there's a judgment. From, who, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Father, we pray for your guidance as we look into this message today. Guide us through your word, I pray. This day, we ask these things in your name. Amen. I was trying to think about trained and untrained people in this world. And 
driving the streets of Jakarta, I've come to realize there are some motorcycle drivers who have never had an hour of training. Maybe not five minutes of training. When they were infants, their mothers carried them on a motorcycle. When they were eight, they could ride it by themselves. By 10, they're, carrying, they're driving their friends around, the, around on the motorcycle by themselves. You've seen these people, right? They've never been trained. They've never went to a class and probably don't have a driver's license. And here they are out driving their motorcycles around. But then there are those who have gone to instructions and have, have taken the courses on safety and are care, are, 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 they know how to be careful. They know how to operate their motorcycle correctly because they've been trained and they have a legitimate driver's license, right? So we have two categories of, of motorcycle drivers that we're well aware of. But I, So on a given day, uh, the first motorcycle driver who's never had any training rushes in front of a bus and gets run over by the bus and we think, oh, poor guy. If he had a little bit of training, maybe that could have been avoided. If he was taught a little bit more about safety and, and things, maybe he would have not had that terrible thing happen in his life. The second guy on a given day is also in a hurry, and he jumps in front of a bus and gets run over, and we say, you knew better than that. You knew better than that. You've had the classes. You, you've, you've received the instruction. You knew better than that. In this parable, I'd kind of like to use an illustration similar to this, because in this, in this story, the master returns, and he finds people with different levels of instruction and how they lived with that instruction. Now, the angel told the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, that he who went up in the clouds will return from the clouds. He went up bodily in the clouds. He's going to return bodily from the clouds. So the return of Christ we know is physical, not spiritual. All right? So we don't want to spiritualize his return. It is a physical return of the Lord Jesus. It's also an expected return. He is going to return. So we know it's going to happen, but it's an unexpected time. Right? He didn't tell us when. And so Jesus, in all of his teachings, he just says, be ready. You don't know when, but you know that he is coming. For us as Christians, the second coming of Christ is what we would call a primary doctrine. It's very important to us. It is not a minor teaching. It is not an unimportant. It's not secondary. No, it is a critical part of our teaching. It is a substantial reality in our faith, right? Right? Because the second coming of Christ, it brings all of his teaching to completion. There are many promises of God that have not yet been fulfilled. And, and, and many of those, we will see their completion upon the return of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, where we're told he's coming, here's what's going to happen. And so when he comes, there will be a completion of many of the promises that are left to be fulfilled. Now, it might seem like the world is out of control, rushing to chaos. It might seem like the, 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 the railroad tracks that this train of this world is on is, is, loose, is, is lost in the end, and the train has lost its brakes, and it's speeding to, to a crash. It's not, because Jesus is going to return. And before the world comes to a collapse, he will return, right? We know this. We accept this as truth from his teaching. What's going to happen when he returns? This is what Jesus is teaching. I'm going to return. You don't know when. It is a specific event. The world is not going to come to nothing. I will come, and I will bring my judgment. Before it's all said and done, I will create a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell forever. So we know he's going to come. When he comes, he's going to find four groups of people. All right? Let's first of all look at the faithful. The faithful. These are the faithful servants who represent all who know and love their master. These are the servants like Peter. They listen to the Lord.
They served the Lord. They prepared their lives. They waited for the Lord. They were glad. Next slide, please. So all of the faithful are those of us who have given our hearts to Jesus Christ. We've trusted Him as Savior. The Holy Spirit of God has come into our hearts and lives. We, we read His Word. We allow the Word to filter into our life. We believe the Word of God. And, and we direct our lives under the authority of the Word of God. We direct our lives under the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And we live prepared for His return. Maybe not perfectly, but we're prepared for His return. All right? We're trying to live without regrets if He were to come today. We could say without doubt, the faithful servant represents all who are saved, all who, having been saved, are patiently waiting and looking forward to the glorious return of the Lord. If He came today, wouldn't that be awesome? Today. Before we finish our message today, before we finish church, or you go home and before you finish lunch or before you put your pajamas on and get in bed, the Lord returns and calls us to himself. Wouldn't that be glorious? You're allowed to say amen. Amen. <laughs> That'd be awesome for the Lord to return. We are waiting that glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is built around verse 40. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour that you do not expect Him. Okay? It says that He will come. And He'll come at an hour you don't expect Him. He said, therefore, be ready. Be aware. Be watchful. The thief might come, but if you're ready, you know He's coming and you aren't caught unaware. These are the faithful. I believe all who know the Lord Jesus are part of the faithful. Because the description of the next three are all unfaithful people. Let's look at the first category of unfaithful. Okay, the unfaithful, three categories here, who are unfaithful. We've already read these passages. The first category includes those whose lives are so filled with selfishness that they disregard the needs of anyone else as they satisfy their own lusts. This is their life. They ignore any teaching about the master's return. They take their life into their own hands. They mistreat other people. They have what they consider master-appointed authority. God gave them abilities in this life, and now they're using those abilities to abuse people. Romans 1 speaks of those on a downward spiral away from God. They reject God in their knowledge, and God gives them up to all kinds of uncleanness, all kinds of immorality, all kinds of sexual perversion. They've heard the truth. They know what the truth says. They know who God is, but they've rejected Him completely in their life. This might be the servant who's trying to get out from under the authority of his master. And by the way, everybody born into this life is born under God's authority. Are you aware of that? Psalm 139 speaks of, the, of us being formed by God in the womb. Is anybody born in this life outside of God's authority? No. Are any, is, is anybody truly an accident in this life? No. Every life comes from God. He is the only giver and taker of life. We don't believe in abortion. We don't believe in murder because we believe there's one God who gives and takes life. And life is in God's hands. So everybody who is born is born under God's authority. And so this first, this first slave does not respect his Lord and Master. He never has. He's spent his life looking to get out from under God's authority. He's rejected God's authority at every place he can in his life. If there's ever an opportunity to get something for himself, he jumped at it. 
He doesn't care if the master's returning. That is not even on his radar. He could care less if the master's returning. He's going to live his life the way he wants to live it. This might be similar to the foolish builder in Matthew 7. He hears the word, but he rejects the word and builds his life on the sand. He knows the truth, but has rejected it along the way. That's why I use the illustration of the trained motorcycle driver. He knows safety rules. He knows the instruction of what to do and how to be careful all the way through his training. He was given the right way to operate that vehicle. But he rejected that instruction to his own destruction. The second category of servants, they know what the master expects, but they choose to live otherwise. Now, this group of people, they may not disrespect others, and they may not steal from the master, but they do not take time nor energy to be ready when the master returns. They live a decent life. They know morality. They live decently within that structure of human morality. But they're lazy. They're self-absorbed. And they've chosen to ignore the master's instructions in their life. I thought of a sad story in Paul's ministry about a man named Demas. You heard of Demas? Anybody guys know who Demas is? Next slide, please. This guy in Colossians 4.14, Paul writes about him, and he says, Demas greets the church in Colossae. In Philemon 24, Demas sends a greeting. So Demas was a partner, a co-worker, a co-traveler with Paul in his missionary journeys. But 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul tells Timothy that Demas has forsaken him, having loved this present world. Here's a guy that knew the truth and decided, I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to serve God anymore. The world around me has distracted me, and that's what I want. And knowing the truth, knowing what he should be doing, he said, I don't want that for now in my life. And he walked away from serving and walked away from Paul. He might be the servant in the second category. He didn't do terrible things, but he walked away from truth that he knew. This morning in our scripture reading, we had read to us the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Isn't that a terrible story? You say, why would you read that in church? I'm preparing you for this message, okay? Terrible story. Barnabas gives, sells a plot of land, gives the money away to the church out of the fullness of his heart. And the church says, man, Barnabas, you are such an encourager. Ananias and his wife say, hey, we'd like to have some of that praise that Barnabas got. Let's sell some of our land, let's, but not, let's not give all the money away. We're not as good as Barnabas, really. They, gave, they agreed to give a certain part of the money to the church, which was fine. But they lied and said they gave the entire amount. To the church. What did Ananias know? They knew truth. They knew the gospel. They knew how they were supposed to live. But they got distracted by selfish desires. And being distracted, they disobeyed the word of God that they knew. They might be the second category of servant. The third category of servants are those who missed the master's instructions, and they live lives doing whatever they think is good to do. Okay? So when the master's giving instructions, they were out playing somewhere. They missed it. (laughs) They didn't ask anybody what the master say. They just lived their life without any instruction from the master. But they choose to live that way. Okay? Maybe you missed your boss's instruction. You missed a meeting, but you're calling somebody and say, hey, can you give me the notes of that meeting? I missed the meeting. I want to know what I'm supposed to do. These servants didn't do that. They missed the meeting, didn't ask for instructions, and lived their life apart from God's instructions without ever seeking to know 
what God wants from them. Okay? Now, I, I compare this to the untrained motorcycle guy who never asks for instructions. He's doing pretty good most of the time, but it doesn't take him long to really get in a bad situation. And those who live their life rejecting God's instruction, never hearing it, never wanting to hear it, kind of apathetic toward God and toward religion, they're still going to face the Lord one day. And that's the point Jesus makes here. Three types of unfaithful servants. They are all lost, and they are all facing God's judgment. All right, so in Luke 12, 46, we see the third point, the Lord's return. Luke 12, verse 46, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. All right, notice the word will, all right, very positive, definite, definite word. It's, it's going to happen, okay? You will have lunch today is probably a true statement. Some of you will play volleyball today, all right? Some of you will not. Some of you will. We, we use this word. We know what it means. It's not a difficult term. So from this, we can determine, first of all, Jesus will return. And in the parable, he's the master. The master will return, okay? Secondly, when the Lord returns, the entire wor world will will be held accountable for their own obedience or disobedience to the Lord's instruction. Okay? This is what Jesus is teaching. There will be an accountability. There is certainty here. We must understand Jesus is speaking a very specific message to us. And then we know all will be held accountable all will bow to King Jesus, Philippians 2.9, at the name of Jesus. You know the verse? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow. You can go down through history. You can pick the worst person that you can ever imagine or know about the most unrepentant sinner, or perhaps the most careless person that's ever lived, at that time, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Brothers and sisters, the Lord will return. And after he returns, when he returns, there's going to be the judgments. Let's take a moment on the judgments. This is Luke 12, 46 to 48. There's going to be a judgment. And this, this should get our attention, okay? This should get our attention. There is going to be a judgment. For the faithful, when the master returns, he'll put them in charge. He will rejoice over them, and they will rejoice over him. There's going to be rejoicing for the faithful. Matthew 25, 21 says they will enter into the joy of the Lord. They will enter the joy. The what? The joy. What is heaven a place of? A place of joy. They will enter into the joy of the Lord. Isn't that a contrast? Being hacked in pieces, <laughs> being beaten, entering the joy of the Lord. This is for the faithful. There will be rejoicing. God, the master, will rejoice over them, and we will rejoice with him, the faithful. But for the unfaithful, there are different levels of judgment. And here's where the message gets painful. It just is. For the unfaithful, the first category, they will be cut into pieces and assigned the eternal punishment of unbelievers. Woo! That's terrible. Are you sure that's what, that's what it says? Can we go back to the Greek and check that out? Maybe that's not quite what it says. No, that's exactly what it says. Why would he do that? Why would he cut them in pieces? Why doesn't he just say, you're fired? 
Why doesn't he just say, okay, get more, more, more lashes with the whip? Why does he use this idea of cutting them in pieces? Well, we have to go to a Jewish audience here. We're not Jewish audience. We were not first century. In First Chronicles chapter 20, there's a time when David went to battle. Joab leads the, leads the army out. And uh, when he brings the king, the enemy king, back to Jerusalem, David takes the king, the crown off the king's head, a huge crown, a crown of a, a full talent of gold with full of precious stones. The king's treasure is in the crown itself. And then it says he, they brought all the treasure to the, peop, to, to, to the city. And then he brought the people who were in the city and cut them with saws and sharp instruments and with axes. They hacked the people to pieces. And then it says, and thus David did to all the cities of the sons of Ammon. I said, man, that almost makes me not, to, not want to read the Bible. <laughs> that almost makes me question, is God of any mercy if this is what they did, right? What we, what we, what we realize here is this is the fiercest form of, of God's judgment, the most severe judgment of God that's demonstrated to ma from man to man is the cutting up of your enemy into pieces. Same word used, Exodus 29, 29, 17, of cutting up an animal for sacrifice. God's severest judgment. You are outside of of the enemies of God, and you hear that the people of God went and killed the enemy and didn't even give them decent burials but hacked them to pieces, you would be afraid of that army, wouldn't you? We don't want them coming here. Who are these people? This is God's judgment on a people that were so full of sin, so full of iniquity. God said, leave nothing of them even together. That's strong. Very strong. And so God says, this severe judgment is for those who know me. They know my instruction. And they intentionally turn their heart away from me. They intentionally live their life mocking me, hurting people, disobeying me, have no concern for my return. This is their judgment. Second category is not quite so bad. It says they will be beaten with many blows. Now, they're still disobedient servants, so we don't see these in the category of the redeemed. And there's punishment. It's just not as severe as being hacked in pieces. The third category, this is the guy that didn't hear instructions and never wanted to hear instructions, says he is beaten with few blows. Why? Why three different levels? Why such severity? Why me middle severity and less severity? Well, it's because God is faithful and just. God knows the wickedness of people. And you know what? As a human being, I'm glad there are some people's God's judgment is going to be more severe on. There are certain people who lived in this life so wicked and so vile, people that committed genocide, people that did all kinds of horrible things to other people throughout their life, seem to have no conscience of the destruction and the evil of their way. I am thankful that God will one day judge them for that. And it will be a severe judgment between them and God. I, I, I'm, I'm glad for that as a human, that there is judgment on the vilest who reject God and die rejecting Him. I, I, I pray they'll trust Christ, but most of them don't. And they face Him in their vile heart. God is just. But there are those who are against God, but not that bad. <clears throat> they are still separated from God. They still receive His judgment. And even the decent person, who isn't really so bad of a guy that rejects God's instruction, doesn't care about his instruction, and is not prepared when he returns. There is still correction. 
that will be given. There's three categories represent those who live their lives unprepared to meet the Lord. All three categories then are the lost of this world. People born under God's gift of life and given the opportunity in this life to live under God's authority and instruction. So all these people are given the opportunity to live under God's instruction. All three categories choose not to. Is God just? Will God judge in his perfect justice? This is what Jesus is teaching here. This is the justice of God. Luke 12, 47, the principle is to who, 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 those who have been given much, much shall be required. Those who are given much, much shall be required. Let me give you a thought here. According to this passage, truth, the truth of God is dangerous to know. Those who know God's truth and reject it put themselves in a dangerous position. You understand that? Peter says, who is this for? In essence, he's asking, who needs to be afraid? And Jesus says, not the faithful. The faithful are received. But those who reject, those are the ones that need to be worried. Can I look at some lessons together with you? To kind of pull this together for us today. Lesson number one, we know our Lord is going to return we just don't know when, okay? Next slide. We know he's going to return. Thankfully, we know he's going to return. <laughs> we don't know when, okay? Second truth, we know there is a reward for the faithful, for those who are ready for their Lord's return. And again, this gives us hope, right? You are going to return. Lord, may I be faithful you when you return. Some of you heard this week about a, a very well-known U.S. preacher that admitted immorality and has lost all of his influence. How sad. For a while, this man, in all of his biblical knowledge and wisdom, he somehow forgot to stay prepared for the Lord's return, and he somehow, somewhere, he allowed his flesh to enter his life, and he stopped living prepared for the Lord's return. May that not be any of us. May we live our lives always prepared for the Lord's return. The third lesson is we know there's a judgment for those who do not come to faith in and follow the Master. We know this. There's a judgment for all who die apart from Christ, all who reject the Lord and are not prepared for His return. Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And every, every servant who, who dies apart from God's truth will fall into his hands. It will be a fearful moment for them to do so. Let me give you a fourth lesson. This lesson is not in this text, but it's in many other texts. After church last Sunday, one of you on the way out said, said Pastor, good message, but you missed a point. Well, the point you offered me to give last week wasn't in the passage, but I want to add that point this week because it is important, okay? The other lesson is this. Those of us who have come to faith have the responsibility, the trust from God with his gospel to invite the faithless into the faith. The faithless are the three categories of servants who die unprepared. They are apart from faith. We who have faith in Christ are now called with this gospel to call and invite others into the faith. The Great Commission is for all disciples of Jesus Christ. We are to, to give the gospel to the lost. We are to pray for their salvation. We are to disciple them to maturity, to the fullness of Christ. So they then will go out and make disciples. We, we desire that all of us one day hear these words from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. 
well done, good and faithful servant. This is what Jesus says to all who appear before him, having done what he said. What he says is not difficult. We just need to be faithful to it. Faithful to his gospel. Faithful to giving out the gospel to others. Realizing that everybody apart from Jesus is a lost servant. Do you understand that? Every person apart from Jesus Christ is a lost servant. Their life came from God. But they've chosen in this life to reject God at some level. Which makes them a lost and an unfaithful servant to the one who gave them life. Their accountability to God is going to happen. It's unavoidable. They will give account of their life to God at some point. And when they do, God and his justice will bring punishment upon them for eternity. What do we do with that? We give them the gospel. The gospel is the cure. The only answer is the gospel. But it is all they need. This is our call throughout the scripture to take the word of God to those who are lost. William Barclay was a preacher of 100 years ago or more. I used to have his commentaries. He told a fable of three apprentice demons. And these three apprentice demons were, were up in front, of, uh, up in front of, of, of the devil, and the devil asked them a question. and says, all right, you guys are about to be released to go and do, do your work on earth. What are you going to tell humans to keep them away from the gospel? The first, the first apprentice demon says, huh, I'm going to tell them there is no God. I'll just tell them there's no God. And Satan said, well, that's not going to work very well because most people know there is a God. The second one said, I'll tell you, I'll tell them there is no hell. There's no danger of eternal damnation. And Satan said, well, some of you will, some, some will believe that, but everybody knows there's punishment for sin. The third apprentice said, I'll tell them there's no hurry. You can wait until tomorrow, and it'll be okay. Too many people believe they have till tomorrow. Too many people say, I don't want Jesus today. I want him, just not today. I was in a Christian university. A student next to me named Dave, we were in the same dormitory. Dave began to turn away from his Christian faith. Had a conversation with Dave. I said, Dave, what are you doing? He said, ah, Steve, he said, I'm just looking around me, and everything in the world is for me. And I just really don't want to live for Jesus yet. But I, I just want to go out and enjoy the world a while first. Isn't that what Satan's demons tell us? Just go out and enjoy a little while. Take some time. Dave's life was a ruin. I watched him for several years. Couple, couple marriages ruined, women's lives ruined, kids' lives ruined, because Dave waited, not today. 2 Corinthians 6.2. This was a problem in Paul's day also. 2 Corinthians 6.2, for he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, in the, time of, in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. The longer you wait to come to Jesus Christ, the easier it becomes to say, not today. Until one day you've spent your life saying, not today, and you wonder what's happened. And then you think, oh, I'm, I'll never be worthy of that grace. I've said no too many times. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord when? This indicates there's a day you can't find him. There might be a day you've said no so long that you're going to cry out and his, the heavens are going to be brass. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. 
there may come a day that he is not near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. To our God, he will freely pardon. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, do you understand that every person that comes to God will find mercy and will be delivered from judgment? Whether it's being cut in pieces or beaten with, beaten with a whip or whatever it is, the eternal punishment of their sin is removed when they come to him. This is the mercy of God. Let them turn to the Lord, for He will have mercy on them. Now is the time. Today, God may be calling you to His salvation. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, you know who He is, you know the Word of God, but you've said, not me, not yet. Oh, my dear friend, today is the day. The moment you humble yourself to, before God, the moment in your own heart you cry out to him, God, forgive me, I am a sinner undone. I've lived my life in rebellion to you. I turn from my rebellion and I turn to you. God, I've trusted some other religion. Forgive me, they've not helped me. I turn from that religion, I turn completely to you and put all my faith in you. Notice he says, let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy. You want God's mercy? Turn to the Lord. But you've got to turn away from something. You turn away from your sin. You turn away from your bitterness. You turn away from your anger. You turn away from your religion. And you turn to the Lord. Turn to our God because he will freely pardon. We thank you, Lord, today for your eternal salvation. We thank you for your mercy that is new every morning. Lord, for those who rejected your mercy yesterday, it is fresh and new again today. Those who pushed your mercy off the table, it's back on today, being offered again. Father, I pray you'd speak to our hearts this day. This is a hard teaching you gave. We still have questions about what you meant and implications of this teaching that are still unclear to us. But we know that you, de you de described an, a judgment of sin that is unavoidable, a judgment of rejection of the master that is unavoidable. Father, we pray for those we know and love, they might come to know you. We pray for those we care about, we may be able to give them your gospel and, and, and let them know to come to you and to find your mercy and pardon. Lord, may today be the day of salvation for many here, many who hear this, this message, this word from you. May many today come to you and find your mercy and pardon. Determine that it's better off to live waiting for your return than to live in selfishness and disobedience. Please, Lord, guide us in these thoughts. May your Holy Spirit make them clear to our understanding, we pray. We pray these things in Jesus' name.